Hey everybody, how's it going? Coming to you uh, from the Emirates Stadium press box after a really, really disappointing result for the Gunners. That's it now in terms of our title hopes. Um, I know it's not mathematically done, but it certainly feels like that was the final nail in the coffin. I kind of hope that Everton will be able to pick something up earlier on today against Manchester City. And when I arrived here at the stadium, it was nil-nil. There was about half an hour gone and Everton were, were holding their own. But a couple of quick-fire Manchester City goals killed them off and killed our hopes of, of them dropping some points today. I think that did impact the atmosphere a little bit here today. I think it was a little bit flat going into the game off the back of that. The Everton away fixture for Manchester City was one of those that many of us had earmarked as a game in which they could potentially drop points. We know this Manchester City side are on a formidable run of form. They can't stop winning. Um, they made four changes to the side, of course, that played Real Madrid in midweek and still had more than enough to dispatch of Everton uh, with relative ease. But sort of flicking back to our game, I thought Brighton did a fantastic job of impacting Arsenal's rhythm, just stopping them playing and moving the ball with the speed and with the intensity with which we know this Arsenal side likes to play. I think that was what Roberto De Zerbi came here to do first and foremost. Yeah, they're a brilliant side and yes, they can play plenty of football themselves, which they showed in certain periods in the game. But first and foremost for Brighton, it was about coming here today and disrupting Arsenal's rhythm. And I think they did an unbelievable job of doing that, whether it be with fouls, whether it be with keeping the ball when they needed to. Um, very, very confident playing out from the back, as you saw. Jason Steele almost giving the ball to Granit Xhaka in the first half. But generally speaking, he did really, really well. And Brighton love to invite you onto them and um, invite your press. And then they do have the quality to be able to play around it and to get into those spaces. I thought we struggled in midfield. I thought... Jorginho did really well up at Newcastle and did really well here against Chelsea in the game prior to that. But I think what we saw today was exactly why um, was exactly why Jorginho isn't the solution going forward. Because there were elements to his game today, I think, that you could see are not quite at the level of a peak Thomas Partey. Now, I know Thomas Partey hasn't been very good of late. And I understand why Jorginho came into the side and has stayed in the side. He was excellent up at St James's Park last weekend. But when we talk about his shortcomings and we talk about his limitations, I think you saw a lot of them today because Brighton were able to sort of overwhelm him in midfield. They were able to control the ball in midfield. Yeah, he made a number of good interceptions in the first half, I thought. But generally speaking, he couldn't get on the ball enough and dictate the play in the way that we've seen him do uh, very, very often and, and in the way that we know he can. If you take it onto left back, obviously Arsenal were without Alexander Zinchenko today and, um, you know, that was a problem. We keep talking about him defensively and we keep talking about the fact that he does from time to time let Arsenal down in that sense that he doesn't, um, you know, always uh, come out best in, in the one-on-one -on -one defensive situations, that he sometimes struggles with that, that the fact that he's not a defender by nature kind of comes through at times but today putting Kieran Tierney in there I don't know what what difference it made like I know Kieran Tierney was in the team because Zinchenko was unavailable saw him knocking about in his jeans uh, before the game obviously once the team news had been announced because he was pictured in training yesterday but in Kieran Tierney we didn't get a conventional fullbacks performance today he didn't bomb up and down uh, with the regularity or frequency that you'd like to see your fullback do and he didn't go infield and support Jorginho either not enough anyway so I think he kind of got caught between two minds now was that because Brighton have a real threat in the wide areas and CISO who obviously scored today is a real threat for them um, you know he, he played well against us here in the Carabao Cup as well so Arsenal would have known all about him Karu Matoma in the first half at times was playing on the right hand side as well so maybe it was a concern and a worry and a fear of what Brighton had that maybe put Kieran Tierney in those two minds. Maybe he's thinking, yes, my manager has asked me to do this, to play that more inverted role, to go in field. But at the same time, I've got to focus on my primary job, which is to defend well. And, and I, I just didn't see a good enough performance from him. Kivior and Gabriel, I thought, for the most part, did OK. Um, but of course, you know, the nature of the goals that we conceded were really, really disappointing. You know, there's no getting away from that. The first goal... I think is a, is a culmination of errors. I think the ball that goes out to the left-hand side for Karu Mitoma um, is brought down very well by him and then he takes it out wide and Ben White does enough to kind of hold him up. But he doesn't do enough to, 
to dispossess him or to force him back. He, he ends up in a he ends up in a situation where you know he ends up in a situation where he's he's held him up, but he hasn't really done too much. I don't think. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by uh, the noise going on around me. And then Estepinian makes that run on the overlap. And for me, Bukayo Saka's got to go with him, you know. And we talk a lot about how great Bukayo Saka's been this season and how uh, much of a star he is and, and how excited we all are by the prospect of him signing this new contract with the club and staying here for many, many years to come. But his performances in the last few weeks have been poor. And, and, and there's no getting away from that. And I don't see why we should have to dance around that conversation. I thought not only was he ineffective in the final third today, he didn't do his defensive duty on a number of occasions in the second half, I didn't think, supporting Ben White when Estupinian was getting forward, as we know he can. And I think ultimately that is one of the reasons we conceded the first goal. There's a little step on Jakub Kivior's uh, Achilles as well uh, in the penalty area, which kind of takes him out of the equation when the second ball comes in. But when you break it down, right, you can sit and you can analyse it in so many different ways. But ultimately, if... If, a, if an attacker has a free header in the middle of your six-yard box, you're not defending well enough. And it doesn't matter how that situation came about. That's something that you've got to address and it's something that you've got to do better. The centre-halves have to eat that area up and they didn't today. Maybe Kivior does if he doesn't get that knock. But these things happen in football. And I think for me, you know, unless you're tripped and you're put down on the ground, you, you've got to stay on your feet. You've got to stay strong. You've got to stay big. It sounds like I'm having a go at Jakob Kivior here. I'm not. But... You know, I just, I didn't see the level of defending whereby someone is literally defending for their lives. I just didn't see that today from Arsenal in, in that goal. The second goal was, was a terrible goal as well. The way we gave the ball away, um, great finish from, from Undav as Ramsdale came out. He couldn't do anything else, Aaron Ramsdale. He had to come charging out and Undav just calmly just lifts it over the top of his head and uh, finds the back of the net. So... You know, that was that was game over at that point. But even at 1-0, I mean, I didn't feel like Arsenal had enough on the pitch to go out and turn the game back around, to go out and, uh, and come back, which we've seen them do so many times this season. You know, we've looked at this Arsenal team on numerous occasions this season and gone, look how sort of resilient they are. They never give up. They keep going until the very end. But today they went out with a whimper. And that was the real frustration for me. Now, is it that they're burnt out? Is it that they're tired? Is it that they've been performing at this incredibly high level all season and they've just come to the point where they've hit a brick wall? Perhaps it is that. You know, that's, uh, that's not an unfair thing to say and it's something that a lot of us feared would happen. It's something that doesn't happen when you've got a lot of depth and you can change things around and you can freshen things up. But even with the depth that we seem to have gained this season, we're still short in certain areas. Obviously, we lost Gabriel Martinelli early on in the game as well uh, due to injury. And I think that really impacted Arsenal. Leandro Trossard's been great for Arsenal when he's played, but he's not the same type of player as Martinelli. He hasn't got that same drive. He hasn't got that same power when sort of charging down the line. And he doesn't bring that same panic to the defensive unit uh, as Gabriel Martinelli does. I thought Martinelli was probably a little bit fortunate, actually, not to go in the book for that challenge on Karu Mitoma. I know... It wasn't intentional. He just kind of led with his arm, didn't he? And he, he caught Mitoma. Uh, but then he was fouled on a couple of occasions. And in the end, he had to depart uh, after about 20 minutes. Now, what is also worrying is that after the game, when the players sort of applauded the crowd, Gabriel Martinelli uh, sort of walked onto the field and then walked back down the tunnel in a protective boot. Now, I know it's coming to the end of the season and you'd hope that it's nothing serious, but obviously that's never good to see. Hopefully it is just a precautionary thing and hopefully he will be back um, and available sooner rather than later. Um, and then half-time came, nil-nil. Um, the, the biggest talking point in the press room at half-time was the linesman that put his flag up uh, on his near side uh, when actually the, the motion had come off the back of a throw-in, which means that the player wasn't offside. Lots was made of that inside the stadium. A lot of people giving the linesman quite a bit of stick and abuse for that. Seen it on social media. Lots of people saying, look at the standard of officiating in our league. Now, I agree that the standard of officiating in this league is really poor and it needs to improve. But what I will say is, on that occasion, I've got a little bit of sympathy for the linesman because that's a decision that you've got to make in a split second. And sometimes you won't process everything that's gone on around you. That's why you have a team of officials 
um, and it didn't do any harm in the end. But I could just, you could just see that the linesman sort of wanted the ground to open up and swallow him after he realised what he did because he put his flag back down afterwards and then the crowd started getting on him, etc, etc. But yeah, look, um, half-time, Arsenal hadn't played well enough. Had a couple of chances though. Leandro Trossard struck the crossbar. Uh, thought he should have done better there. Thought he needed to keep the effort down. Leandro Trossard seems to enjoy striking the crossbar, doesn't he? His efforts are always struck in a, a type of way where the trajectory is always upwards. And... Um, and it come off the crossbar and, and that was unlucky. There was another opportunity that Martin Odegaard had from the edge of the box. He's been brilliant at picking out those bottom corners this season. He couldn't do it this time. It was just wide of Steele's left-hand post. And the other real standout moment for me was the opportunity that fell to Bukayo Saka. I thought he did really well to kind of compose himself, wait for the ball to drop, didn't snatch at the chance. And then he, he hits it left-footed and it's just wide of the, uh, of the near post again. Um, so we had a few moments in the first half, but we couldn't find the breakthrough. We couldn't break the deadlock. And then the second half begins in the worst possible fashion. Six minutes into the second period, uh, that Julio and Ciso goal came along. And from then on, you know, you worried because you know that Arsenal weren't quite at it today. You worried because Brighton had done, as I mentioned, a really, really good job of stifling us, a really, really good job of making sure that we weren't finding our rhythm, that the, the patterns of play that we see so frequently um, were sort of um, were, were disrupted. One of the things that I've talked about a lot this season is the way that Mikel Arteta likes passes to go into his wingers. So they're not necessarily always pinged out as wide as possible. Sometimes they're played into that half space in this kind of reverse angle. And then Saka comes off of the touchline, Martinelli comes off of the touchline and receives those balls. We didn't see that really worked today not because we weren't trying it but because Brighton were alert to it and I thought did a really good job of of stopping that and um, and preventing us from uh, sort of taking advantage of that and then we got to the 60th minute and Mikel Arteta made a couple of changes he took off uh, Jorginho who as I've already discussed I thought didn't have a great game today um, maybe not all down to him maybe partly down to the fact that we didn't do things well enough in other areas of the pitch to support him and, uh, and we couldn't cope with the, the things that Brighton were doing well in the midfield. But he just didn't control the game, didn't dictate the game. And I, and I remember thinking at half-time, you know, he's got the technical ability. There's no doubt about that. But has he got the physical attributes to really dominate in midfield? And I remember, genuinely speaking, at half-time saying that maybe we should make that change. Maybe we're seeing today what it is that Jorginho doesn't have in comparison to Thomas Partey when he's at his best. Mikel Arteta made that change after 60 minutes. He also brought on uh, Reese Nelson at the same time. But he took off Granit Xhaka along with Jorginho. Now, I understand the logic behind that, right? You're losing the game. You need to win the game. So take off Granit Xhaka and bring on the more attack-minded uh, sorry, Reese Nelson and put Leandro Trossard, who is more attack-minded than Granit Xhaka, into that position, into that hole, um, into that left eight area, so that he can, um, so that he can help out, and so that he can try and be creative in that sense. But I thought when we did that, we gave up control of the game, and this is the thing that frustrates me sometimes when, when sort of watching Mikel Arteta's sides, is that it becomes too panicky, too gung ho, too soon. Um, look, 60 minutes, I know, is 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 the time to panic, right? You've got half an hour left. You're trailing. You need two goals against a side that you've really struggled to make an impact on. So I get it. But at the same time, I think when you take out somebody like Granit Xhaka, you're giving up control. You're giving up physical presence. You're giving up that territory for me because Xhaka, for all his faults, and, and there are some, of course, he is physical. He's been really streetwise, I think, this season, not necessarily in terms of getting involved in the nonsense that he gets involved in, but in terms of his positioning, He's knowing when to commit a foul. He's knowing how to break the game up, all of those things. You take that out, you put Trossard in, and then you're talking about Trossard playing on one side, Odegaard on the other, and with a, Georgie, in the, uh, sorry, with a Thomas Partey at that point, that's come on cold to the game and, and hasn't been in the best of form anyway. So I'm not sure I would have made both of those changes. I probably would have brought Reese Nelson on because I thought he actually had a decent impact when he came on. Not sure I would have done that, though. Um, it... it Maybe it was, it was the right thing to take off Bukayo Saka, but Mikel Arteta is always reluctant to do that. 
You know, we've talked about his performances. They haven't been up to the standard that we've come to expect. Maybe today was the time to take him off instead and allow us to keep trying to control that midfield with Granit Xhaka in there as well. I don't know. That's what I would have done. Um, and then on 77 minutes, another couple of changes from Arsenal. Uh, Eddie and Ketia came on for Gabriel Jesus. Jesus lost today for me. You know, he, he, he didn't link up the play in the way that we know he can. Didn't come out on top in the physical duels like he normally does. Didn't seem as energetic. Wasn't buzzing around as much as he normally does. There wasn't as much variation to his positioning, I didn't think, as we normally see. Maybe that's something that he's more inclined to do when playing with Martinelli. So maybe Martinelli's departure impacted that. Not sure. Um, but he comes off, replaced by Eddie Nketiah. And Emil Smith-Rowe comes on to replace Martin Odegaard. Now, look, I know Martin Odegaard wasn't having his best game today. There's no question about that. But Emil Smith-Rowe, if I'm being completely blunt and honest here, hasn't done anything in an Arsenal shirt all season. So what makes a manager think that on 77 minutes that Emil Smith-Rowe coming in from the cold is going to be better use of better use than Martin Odegaard? Now, Odegaard wasn't having a great game, but we know he's capable of providing moments and we know he's got that quality in him and he only needs something to click for him to be able to produce. I mean, he didn't play very well, I didn't think, against Southampton uh, here, but it was his goal, wasn't it, that kind of sparked the comeback uh, to mean that we at least got the point. So, yeah, I, I, some of the substitutions and changes today, and I'm not normally one to really go big on that, to really sort of dissect the manager's moves in game like that because I always say to myself that yeah maybe I'd have done something different but there are probably factors you understand maybe someone's in the red in terms of their fitness in terms of the risk of it of an injury I always think as a manager you you know more about that you have more insight to that and I can normally try and find some justification for some of those moves but today I couldn't find any justification for any of the decisions really uh, that Mikel Arteta made in game and then it looked like the game was fading away anyway. It didn't look like Arsenal were going to equalise, if we're honest. The closest we came was that Rhys Nelson effort shortly after he came on where he cut inside and sort of drove it towards the far post, but it ended up going wide in the end. Um, and then, of course, another mistake on 86, gifting a goal to Denis Undav. And then, uh, of course, uh, Purvis Estepinian added the third goal in the 96th minute, the sixth minute of eight added on at the end of the game so I think the scoreline people that didn't watch the game will look at the scoreline and go oh my word what was that Arsenal weren't battered here today they were beaten by a Brighton side who did a very very good job on them who made sure that they limited Arsenal to very very little and um, and in the end when gifted opportunities took those opportunities with both hands in the cases of Undav and the goal that Esther Pinyan scored which again the defending around it was really, really poor, really shocking at 2-0 on 86 minutes. It was unlike this Arsenal team to give up because we've seen them fight till the very death on numerous occasions this season, but they really did today. And I just wonder what an impact the result earlier today had on their mood. I know that Mikel Arteta would have been working really, really hard behind the scenes to try and, uh, and limit the impact of that. I know that he would have been you know, keen for them not to be obsessed by what went on at Goodison Park and I know that he would have wanted uh, them to just be fully focused on today but that was one of the games I think that you know, maybe internally, can't speak for that but certainly externally people had looked at and said this could be the week that we make up some ground and obviously that wasn't to be disappointing outcome uh, in the end uh, for Arsenal in terms of today's game in isolation but in terms of the wider context as well because you know, even the most optimistic of Arsenal fans now uh, won't believe that the title charge is still on, won't believe that the title push is still on. Um, but yeah, it's um, a disappointing afternoon at the office, I have to say. The stadium's pretty much empty now, just uh, looking away to my right, the Sky Sports crew uh, doing their thing. Micah Richards, Patrick Vieira, Roy Keane, Kelly Cates, um, all standing there. It must be an ad break. <laughs> Um, some of the players have just come out for a, a warm down uh, and have now made their way back into the tunnel as well. So an empty Everett Stadium, an opportunity to, I guess, reflect. Um, I, I, my kind of final message would be before we sort of wrap this up and 
and obviously we'll revisit it tomorrow remember uh, Chronicles of Aguna members on the Another Slice platform you can uh, check out my post-match player ratings they'll be available to you um, as soon as I'm able to upload them uh, so do check those out pretty underwhelming in terms of the ratings that I've given some of the players today but if you saw the game that I saw today then I think you'll probably agree with the majority of that but as I say my kind of final message to wrap it all up is look, it's been a magnificent season it's been a season that has taken us on a ride that I don't think anybody expected us to be on not even the most positive of Arsenal fans there has been some disappointment there have been mistakes there have been moments that we're not going to be able to get out of the back of our minds probably for the duration of the summer and maybe beyond that but there have been more positives than negatives this team has come on leaps and bounds this team you know is going to finish with 80 plus points this team is going to finish second in the Premier League and has re-established the club as a Champions League participant lots and lots to be positive about Mikel Arteta is learning all the time the players are learning all the time are improving all of the time I think we've burnt out when we really needed to be able to turn to experience and depth we didn't have those two things certainly not in the uh, way that Manchester City do and, and I'm not saying we're ever going to have the resource that Manchester City do that's the thing right there's a chance that you know this this club won't be able to go and spend the money that they've spent over the years and won't be able to build that type of side but as I was saying on the radio earlier on I think that the, the best way to kind of contextualize Arsenal's season so far and and what they've what they've done and and sort of how far they've come is to almost ignore Manchester City look at the fact that they're this juggernaut look at the fact that they've been winning games left right and center for seasons look at the fact that they're probably going to be champions for what the fifth time in six seasons look at all of those things understand that's where you want to be that's the benchmark that's what you're aiming for that's what you're striving for and um and rather than get caught up on on where we are now and rather than get caught up on what's happened in the last couple of months focus on now what we need to do to try and close that gap even further because we have closed it so so much this season still not closed it completely but we've moved forward some of our players are getting better and better with each passing season I think it's clear the areas in which we need to develop and in the areas which we still need to add new players. And, um, and hopefully, although it's a disappointing end to the season, what's happened at the end of the season will offer some clarity to those making the decisions with regards to what needs to happen next to continue on this journey and to take it further and further and further. But look, as I say, the scoreline, I think, flattered Brighton a little bit in that it wasn't a 3-0 game. But... Um, you know, Arsenal were, were shabby in places, were sloppy. Arsenal were not at it today as an attacking force either. You know, in recent weeks, we've looked at the attack and gone, well, they're doing their job, they're scoring goals. But the back line have let us down or, or lapses in concentration defensively have been our downfall. You can't say that today. Today, you have to be honest and say that right throughout the team, we weren't functioning in the level that we know we can. And... Um, and you know you have to be incredibly consistent to win this Premier League and we've just fallen short in the end but hey um, we take it we move on um, and yeah uh, just a quick reminder as well that this podcast is of course brought to you by the good people over at NordVPN so if you're interested in the VPN service which unlocks a whole load of doors you'll be able to change your virtual location to access films uh, TV series subscriptions and internet online content that you can't uh, due to geo blocks you'll be able to buy flights from your destination which can uh, end up being cheaper if you change your virtual private uh, location and on top of that uh, you can of course uh, protect yourself with an added layer of security when surfing the World Wide Web. Go over to nordvpn.com forward slash chronicles AFC. The link is in the description below and uh, you'll be able to access that offer. It's the price of a cup of coffee per month to put it into context and uh, the uh, possibilities are endless, which is fantastic. Um, if you do sign up via the Chronicles of Aguna link, you'll not only get a mega discount on your plan, you'll also get four months additional free at the end of your term as well so if it is something that you'll use if it is something you're interested in check it out the offer is there only for a couple more weeks i think if you've got any questions about it because i'm a regular user of the service then please do let me know right gonna love you and leave you guys uh, from the emirate stadium i'll see you all 
uh, tomorrow with some more content as we um, try to get over this disappointment. It is a disappointment, but I'm trying to stay positive as well because I think it's difficult in these moments to see the bigger picture. But I think the only way you can cope with what's happened at the back end of this season is to focus on how positive the bigger picture looks. Take the good bits, build on those good bits and try and build something that can get closer to rivaling Manchester City next season. That's, um, that's where we've got to go from here. And hopefully, as I say, the positive that we can take from the negatives is, is some clarity around what needs to happen and what, what needs to improve. Um, but yeah, right. I'll uh, leave it there. Catch you all soon. Like, subscribe, share. You know the drill. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Until next time, goodbye.